Declaro abierto. I call to order the 1977th meeting of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. The committee will proceed with agenda item four, consideration of reports submitted by states parties under article 18 of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This morning, the committee will consider the ninth periodic report of China. I take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to all those who will be online observers on the webcast during this dialogue. In particular, I should also like to extend a warm welcome to all civil society representatives, including women's organizations. The live webcast of this dialogue will also be available in Chinese. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Schneider, the Secretary of the CEDAW Committee for an announcement. Mr. Schneider, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make a, an announcement concerning filming, recording, and dissemination of audiovisual materials during, during the dialogue. So during this dialogue, uh, the unauthorized filming, recording, and dissemination of audiovisual materials is not uh, allowed. And um, there will be a webcast of the dialogue, and you can find the recording of the webcast on UN Web TV. However, accredited media representatives have the right to attend, film, and take pictures uh, during the dialogue and they are required to wear their press badge issued by UNOC at all times. Um, photographers or camera teams hired by state party delegations have the right to film the introductory and closing remarks of the head of delegation, and private group pictures can be taken before or after the public meeting, but not during the public meeting, and subject to the consent of the persons photogra photographed or filmed. Other than that, during the dialogue, please do not take any pictures, and do not film the dialogue um, here in this meeting room. Thank you. I would now like to welcome the high-level delegation headed by Her Excellency Ms. Wang, Vice Chairperson of the National Working Committee on Women and Children under the State Council Minister level, who will introduce the report. Before giving the floor to the head of delegation, I would like to express on behalf of the entire committee our deep appreciation of our colleague, Ms. Shi Jia. Through her expertise, Ms. Jia has greatly contributed to the work of the committee, including during state party reviews. I feel honoured to work with her on the committee. I would like to remind the delegation that the introductory statement should not exceed a total of 40 minutes. The delegation is further reminded that in order to allow for full and accurate interpretation of their statements, participants are requested to speak at a reasonable pace. I would now like to give the floor to the head of delegation for her to introduce the report and make her opening remarks, including the three reports that make up that report. Madam, you have the floor. If you wish, you may introduce the other members of your delegation. Madam Chairperson, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to make this introductory statement on behalf of the Chinese government 
at the consideration of China's ninth periodic report on the implementation of the CEDAW Convention. First of all, I wish to thank Madam Chairperson for your outstanding leadership and all members of the committee for the conscientious preparation for this consideration. I say so on behalf of the entire Chinese delegation. As the state party to the convention, the Chinese government adheres to the spirit of the convention, fulfills its obligations, and submits state party reports on time. For this consideration, China has sent a high-level delegation consisting of the central government and the governments of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region and the Macau Special Administrative Region. Delegates to the central government are from major departments and ministries, including the Social Development Affairs Committee of the National People's Congress, the Supreme People's Court, the Organization Department of CPC Central Committee, the United Front Work Department of the CPC Central Committee, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Education, the National Ethnic Affairs Commission, the Ministry of Public Security, the Ministry of Civil Affairs, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security, the National Health Commission, the Information Office of the State Council, the National Bureau of Statistics, the National Administration for Disease, Prevention and Control, and the Office of the National Working Committee on Children and Women under the State Council. These ministries are responsible for promoting women's development and protecting rights and interests. We are ready to engage in constructive dialogue with the committee in an open and candid manner. Madam Chair, members of the committee, to prepare for the State Party report, China set up a working group composed of 29 ministries and departments. In drafting the report, we highly valued the participation and inputs of NGOs, academics and experts from research institutions participated in the drafting. We also solicited opinions from over 20 social organizations, institutions on gender studies and women's development, as well as women's organizations in 31 provinces, autonomous regions and municipalities on many occasions. This fully demonstrates China's openness, transparency and responsible approach when it comes to the implementation of the convention. The report was submitted in March 2020 on schedule, providing a comprehensive reflection of China's policies, practices, and achievements in promoting equality between men and women and women's all-round development, as well as the latest developments and progress on implementing the concluding observations from the last consideration. In February 2023, the Chinese government submitted replies to the committee's list of issues. In the meantime, the governments of Hong Kong SAR and Macau SAR drafted and submitted their respective implementation reports and replies. Madam Chair, members of the committee, the Chinese government attaches great importance to equality between men and women and women's all-round development. When attending the Global Leaders Meeting on Gender Equality, and women's empowerment in 2015 and the UIGA, UNGA high-level meeting on the 25th anniversary of the fourth World Conference on Women in 2020, the Chinese President Xi Jinping put forward important propositions, including making the protection of women's rights and interests a national priority and enabling women to advance at the forefront of the times. Since the last consideration, historic achievements have been made in women's development in China, which has embarked on new stage in tandem with economic and social development. Now let me present the following eight aspects. First, the legal system for the comprehensive protection of women's rights and interests has been continuously improved since the implementation of the anti-domestic violence law in 2016 china has continued to strengthen means of intervention including compulsory reporting written warnings and personal safety protection orders
with the law on land contract in rural areas amended in 2018, women are guaranteed their names in the land rights certificates and rights under their names. The civil code promulgated in 2020 explicitly defines the scope of couples joint debt, improves economic compensation mechanism in divorce, and specifies clauses on the prevention of and penalty for sexual assault and harassment. In 2022, the law on the protection of the rights and interests of women was overhauled, featuring four highlights. One, the amendment adopts to the extent possible the CEDAW committee's recommendation in the last con concluding observations to define discrimination by introducing a prohibitive clause on restricting or excluding women. Two, it provides for systems such as gender equality assessment and statistical surveys on women's development. Three, it strengthens special protection for women in such areas as health and eliminating gender discrimination in employment. And four, it improves avenues for remedy. With these revisions, the primary responsibility of the government has been further strengthened. China has put in place a comprehensive legal system comprising over 100 laws and regulations on protecting women's rights and interests. As well as a gender equality based review system for policies and regulations at the national level, as well as in the 31 provinces, autonomous regions, and municipalities. Second, national action plans for promoting women's all round development have been implemented on an ongoing basis. In the five year plans for national economic and social development 2016 to 2020 and 2021 to 2025. There are chapters dedicated to gender equality and women's all round development. Major goals and tasks have been incorporated into department specific programs for health, education, civil affairs, rural revitalization, the rule of law, among others. China's National Human Rights Action Plan has a special section on protecting women's rights to ensure the realization of face-specific goals. As all 56 ethnic groups in China are equal, the legitimate rights and interests of ethnic minority women are better protected. China has promoted fourth, four editions of the National Programme for Women's Development. In response to new requirements for women's development, the current program, that is 2021 to 2030, includes 75 goals and 93 measures in eight development areas, namely health, education, economy, decision-making and management, social security, family building, environment, and the rule of law. More than 40 line ministries and relevant institutions are mandated to implement the goals and tasks. All 31 provinces, autonomous regions and municipalities, over 260 cities and 2,000 plus counties have formulated respected programs according to their local realities. China has developed a mechanism for monitoring gender statistics setting over 1,300 indicators, including those directly reflecting women's development and other gender desegregated indicators for economic and social development. Statistics and data concerning women and children are published regularly. Third, the livelihood and status of women have been significantly improved. China has won a battle against poverty of the largest scale in human history achieving the SDG goal on poverty reduction 10 years ahead of schedule. With 44.16 million rural women out of extreme poverty. 
among the 10 national role models in poverty alleviation. Five are women. Women both contribute to and benefit from poverty reduction. China has built the world's largest social security system. Women enjoy equal benefits and social insurances, including old age, health care, childbirth, unemployment, and work-related injury insurances. 660 million women, including ethnic minority women, women with disabilities, and older women, are covered by basic health care insurance. An increase of 353 million since the last consideration. 85 million people with disabilities, including women, enjoy full support in rehabilitation, education, employment, and the intellectual and cultural sphere. 9 million women in difficulties or with serious disabilities entitled to special government subsidies. Fourth, putting people's lives first, we have improved significantly the health of women. The average life expectancy of Chinese women has exceeded 80. In 2022, maternal mortality rate was 15.7 per 100,000, down by 27.6% compared with the last consideration, with a bigger drop in the rural areas than in the urban areas, achieving the relevant SDG ahead of schedule. During the three years of the COVID pandemic, green channels for emergency treatment of pregnant women were established. During the period, uh, the maternal mortality rate declined by more than 4% every year. In active response to the WHO initiatives, China set great store by the prevention and treatment of cervical cancer and breast cancer. 100 and 18 million cervical cancer screenings and nearly 100 million breast cancer screenings have been provided free of charge for rural women and low-income urban women. The central government has put in nearly 2.5 billion yuan to extend medical treatment to women in financial difficulties. Fifth, the equal right of girls and women to education have been guaranteed. Over the past decade, China's fiscal expenditure on education has been over 4% of the GDP. Free compulsory education has been fully realized in both urban and rural areas. Net primary school enrollment rate for girls has remained above 99.9% .9 since 2015, with essentially no gender gap. More than 50% of female students with disabilities go to ordinary schools. For seven consecutive years, the number of female students in senior secondary education exceeded half of the total. Female students have also outnumbered boys in both undergraduate and postgraduate studies. Up to 15 years of education from preschool to senior secondary has been provided free of charge in Tibet and Xinjiang autonomous regions. In 2020, among the 1.1 billion people in China above the age of 15, the gender gap in terms of years of education was narrowed to 0.6 year. China has worked with UNESCO in setting up the Prize for Girls and Women's Education to encourage more people to work for equity in education. Sixth, unremitting efforts have been made in eradicating all forms of violence against women. China has formulated and implemented consecutive programs against trafficking in persons with a focus on prevention. Special operations have been carried out from 2013 to 2022. 
18,000 cases of trafficking in women and children were solved. The number of human trafficking cases in the decade reduced by 86.2%. Applying zero tolerance, severe penalties were meted out for criminal offenses involving rape and sexual assault. Typical cases have been publicized and the application of law standardized to deter potential crimes. Community workers in urban and rural areas and the staff of women's federations have been organized to pay regular visits to women and households in difficulty, including those women with mental or intellectual disabilities. Campaigns have been launched to provide legal aid and judicial assistance for women and psychological rehabilitation and social services for victims. Since the last consideration in 2014, around 350,000 women have received legal aid every year. Seventh, women's extensive participation in decision-making and management has been promoted. China's election law expressly provides for an increasing larger percentage of women deputies to the National People's Congress and the local People's Congresses. In 2023, women accounted for 26.5% of deputies to the 14th National People's Congress, a 3.1 percentage points increase compared with the last consideration. The percentage of women deputies to the People's Congresses at the provincial, city and county levels increased by 5.1, 6.8 and 7.4 percentage points respectively. In enterprises, women account for about one third of the employee directors, employee supervisors, as well as in the workers' congresses. Women account for 54.4% and 26.8% in urban residence committees and rural villages committees. An increase of six and four percentage points respectively compared with 2014. More than 380,000 women's councils have been established in urban and rural communities through which women are an important agent in community level governance. Eighth, efforts have been made to promote women's participation in high quality development in China women account for over 40% of the workforce and 55% in internet startups. In emerging employment sectors such as digital trade, e-commerce and live streaming, women account for about one third of the workforce. China has introduced special measures to support women in science and technology, who now make up 45.8% of Chinese scientists. There are more than 78,000 women experts reviewers with the National Natural Science Foundation, or nearly 30% of the pool. Women are becoming increasingly prominent in science-related decision-making. As more and more women become paysetters in their respective fields, their independent spirit and unique roles are widely recognized. Inspiring more women to advance at the forefront of the times as builders of the great cause, advocates of civic values and chasers of their dreams. While promoting women's all round development, China attaches great importance to international exchanges and cooperation, maintaining friendly exchanges with women's organizations and agencies in over 140 countries for mutual learning and practical cooperation. China has made continuous contribution to UN Women, supporting the UN to invest more in tackling old problems such as violence, 
discrimination and poverty, and to make a difference in addressing new challenges such as the gender digital divide. China has provided within its ability material support and capacity building for women and children in developing countries, contributing to the advancement of women globally and the achievement of women-related goals as an early harvest of the 2030 Agenda. Madam Chair, members of the committee, as the world's largest developing country, China still faces many challenges in eliminating gender discrimination. For instance, women's development remains unbalanced between rural and urban areas and across different regions and groups. Implicit discrimination against women in employment has not been eliminated. Women's participation in the management of state and economic, cultural and social affairs is to be enhanced. Individual cases violating women's personal and property rights still happen. A more enabling environment for women's development is desired. Greater efforts are required to achieve gender equality. The 20th National Congress of the CPC has drawn the grand blueprint for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Not long ago, President Xi Jinping put forward the Global Civilization Initiative. Women's extensive participation is indispensable for advancing on the Chinese path to modernization and building a civilized and harmonious world, which will in turn create new prospects for the all-round development of women. We will further safeguard women's equal exercise of democratic rights in accordance with the law, their equal participation, economic and social development, and equal sharing of the fruit of reform and development. Here on behalf of the Chinese delegation, I wish to welcome constructive recommendations from Madam Chair and members of the committee, which we will indeed study and consider seriously for adoption. And China will also continue to enhance exchanges and cooperation with the international community to jointly promote the global cause of women. Madam Chair, members of the committee, according to the basic law of the Hong Kong SAR and the basic law of the Macau SAR, while the central government is responsible for the international obligations and duties arising from the application of the convention in the two SARs, their implementation reports were drafted and will be presented by their own representatives. Now, with your permission, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Shirley Lam Shulai and uh, Mr. Hong Wai from the Macau SAR to make their introductory remarks. Thank you, Madam Chairperson and members of the committee. Madam Chairperson, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to have this opportunity to speak on, on the implementation of the CEDAW in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China. The Hong Kong SAR has all along been implementing CEDAW in accordance with the provisions of the basic law and the local laws, including the four pieces of anti-discrimination legislation. Women make up 54% of Hong Kong's population, and the Hong Kong SAR government has all along been committed to promoting women's development and providing support to women. On education, all the legislative efforts, together with a free, universal, and compulsory 12-year education that we offer to all children, equip girls with wings to fly high, and women with tools to excel in the family, career, and social life. Today, nearly 80% of females aged 15 or above in Hong Kong have attained secondary education or above and females now account for more than half of our student enrollments in undergraduate programs. 
and over 60% of the students in taught postgraduate programs. On women in workplace, women in Hong Kong nowadays are not only free to choose in the labor market, but are also taking high positions. Using the civil service as an example, women are now filling more senior positions. Out of our 18 permanent secretaries, the highest civil servant positions in the government, 12 are women, including myself. And also around 40% of all directorate officers are women. In the judiciary, more than one third of our judges and ju judicial officers are women. These figures, comparing to 2014, have all increased significantly. Looking at the private businesses, we see women in Hong Kong breaking the glass ceiling and attaining success. More than 30% of management positions, 50% of public accountants, 51% of solicitors are now women. There are more positive changes for Hong Kong women since 2014. We have since amended our sex discrimination ordinance to provide protection against harassment of breastfeeding women. We have since raised our gender benchmark for appointment to government advisory and statutory body to 35% from the previous 25%. We have also extended the maternity leave from 10 weeks to 14 weeks. The chief executive of the Hong Kong SAR announced in his 2022 policy address that we will set up a women empowerment fund to support women in balancing job and family commitments. The government has further decided to set aside 100 million Hong Kong dollars, which is approximately 13 million US dollars in the 2023 budget to promote women's development further. Chairperson and members, apart from celebrating Hong Kong women's achievements in the past decade, I would also like to take the chance to address certain comments against Hong Kong SAR in some NGO submissions to the committee. Many of the statements in these submissions are based on false information and distorted narratives regardless of the truth, with flawed comments on the situation in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong community was traumatized during the serious violence in 2019, arising from the opposition to a proposed legislative amendment exercise. The scale and level of violent illegal acts were unprecedented. The opposition forces and organizations advocating Hong Kong independence and self-determination blatantly challenged the, the central authorities and the Hong Kong SAR government, pleaded for interference in Hong Kong affairs by external forces and even begged for sanctions against Hong Kong. It is in light of this chaotic context that our police have taken professional and necessary actions to protect citizens' lives and safety, and that there is a necessity to enact the Hong Kong National Security Law, the NSL. I must also respond to two false claims that certain NGOs have presented to the committee in this respect. First, on the so-called gender-based violence alleged to be committed by our police during the serious violence in 2019, we strongly oppose such ungrounded narratives. An example of such baseless claims was a screenshot of a French movie was edited and turned into a poster to fabricate sexual assault allegations against the police. I must stress that Hong Kong is a society that upholds the rule of law. When someone breaks the law, police are duty bound to arrest them and bring them to justice. No one, including the police, is above the law. And we have a two-tier police complaint handling mechanism, which is operating effectively to ensure that every complaint against the police is handled in a fair and impartial manner. 
the Complaints Against Police Office and the Independent Police Complaints Council handle cases with a serious and professional attitude to protect victims who are genuinely abused. Second, I wish to respond to the malicious claim that the NSL has interfered with women's political rights. Following the implementation of the NSL, chaos stopped and stability has been restored in Hong Kong, allowing the enjoyment of rights and freedom, which many people had not been able to enjoy during the period of chaos. The NSL clearly stipulates that human rights shall be respected and protected in safeguarding national security in Hong Kong. All law enforcement actions taken by the Hong Kong law enforcement agencies under the NSL, or indeed any local legislation, are based on evidence strictly in accordance with the law and for the acts of the people and entities concerned, and have nothing to do with their political stance, background, occupation, and gender. Indeed, many Hong Kong people can tell you from their own experience that the implementation of the NSL has effectively ended the chaotic situation in Hong Kong since June 2019. And thanks to the implementation of NSL, livelihood was resumed to normal while economy revived. The Hong Kong SAR government will continue to resolutely carry out our duties and obligations to safeguard national security and at the same time, protect the rights and freedoms that Hong Kong residents enjoy and ensuring the steadfast and successful implementation of the one country, two systems principle. To conclude, the Hong Kong SAR government will continue to dedicate resources to promote the realization of women's dual status, rights and opportunities in all aspects of life. We will also continue to firmly dispel any unfounded and false allegations against the situation in Hong Kong. And last but not least, I would like to thank Madam Wang Xiaowei for her leadership of the Chinese delegation. I must also thank you for your interest and observations on our government's fourth report submitted in 2018. We look forward to sharing with you more about our efforts in our dialogue later today. Thank you. Honorable Chair and members of the committee, it is my great honor to represent the government of the Macau Special Administrative Region to join the delegation together with the central government and the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region to participate in the consideration of the ninth periodic report of China on the implementation of the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against the women by the committee. Since the application of the Com convention to the Macau SAR, the SAR government has been actively promoting the implementation of the convention advocating the spirit of the convention through multiple channels, raising public awareness of women's rights, promoting equality between men and women, implementing equality in education and employment, strengthening the protection of women by providing appropriate support, committing to the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women and enhancing women's status in the economic, political, social, cultural, and other aspects. Allow me to briefly introduce some of the major progress made by the Macau SAR in the implementation of the convention since the previous consideration in 2014. As regards the development of the legal system, the Macau SAR has improved the legal protection of women's rights and interests in various fields through the formulation of or amendment to laws and regulations, including the adoption of the law on preventing and combating domestic violence in 2016, the amendment to the criminal code in 2017 to define sexual harassment as a separate crime and revise the relevant provisions concerning sexual assault in order to intensify the fight against the sexual crimes. 
the amendment to the labor relations law increased maternity leave to 17 days and introduced five days of a paternity leave to further bolster the protection of women. Turning to policies and mechanisms, the Macau SR government has actively implemented various policy objectives through action plans, such as the Macau Youth Policy, the 10-year plan for rehabilitation services, the 10-year action plan for services for older persons, among which many contain content related to the strengthening of the protection of women's rights and the provision of appropriate support for women, etc. The Macau SAR has established the Women and Children Affairs Committee, which is dedicated to assisting the government in formulating and promoting policies and measures concerning women and children's affairs. Under the initiative of this committee, the Macau SAR government has in line with the Beijing Declaration and the Platform for Action and the National Program for Women's Development in China, formulated the Macau Women's, the Macau Women's Development Goals 2019 to 2025 in 2018, with gender equality and comprehensive development as the overall goal, identifying eight key areas of development, namely gender mainstreaming, participation in decision-making, education and training, healthcare, social welfare, safety and law, economy, media and culture, and established the interdepartmental working group to gradually develop and carry out corresponding plans and implementation measures to promote women's development and the protection of their rights and interests. In the past three years, the Macau SAR has been affected by COVID-19. In various anti-pandemic work, women in the Macau SAR have played a crucial role, especially in the field of healthcare, social services, education, and others. And have been at the forefront of anti-pandemic work. This demonstrates that women in Macau SR play a decisive role in social participation and decision making, in particular in crisis, in crisis response, making important contributions to the entire society. Honorable Chair and members of the committee. In 2019, the Chinese government published a white paper entitled Equality Development and Sharing Progress of a Women's Course in 70 Years Since the New China's Founding, exemplifying the great importance that China attaches to women's course. As a special administrative region of China, the Macau SAR is facing a new era and new trends, and the government will continue to promote various measures to protect women's rights and interests, implement the relevant provisions of the convention, coordinate and balance the development interests of women in all aspects, including politics, economy, culture, society, and family, and promote the comprehensive development of a women's cause in an orderly manner. We look forward to having an in-depth exchange of views with the committee during the course of the day for members to better understand the implementation of various provisions of the convention in Macau SAR. I thank you. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank the head of delegation for her introductory statement. Allow me also to thank the two members of the delegation who took the floor on Hong Kong and Macau. Distinguished delegation, as you are aware, the procedure for the committee for the consideration of periodic reports is for questions to be posed by a number of experts. Following that, the delegation will be given an opportunity to respond to those questions. And then, following that, another group of experts will be given an opportunity to ask questions, and the delegation is again given the floor to respond to the questions from the experts. The questions will be asked largely following the order of the Articles of the Convention. This procedure is followed throughout the two meetings of today. I would like to remind the delegation that the committee will aim to complete its consideration of the implementation of the convention by China by 5.30 p.m. today at the latest. 
The dialogue, as we have said, will be webcast live on UN Web TV. I would like to draw the delegation's attention to the need for careful time management, and I encourage the delegation to provide precise, short and direct responses to the experts' questions, as well as to indicate when a response cannot be provided. In that case, your delegation should take note of the questions that cannot be answered immediately. And you may request to submit any pending information in writing within 24 hours, so one working day, one working day from the end of the constructive dialogue, which means in this case it would be by Monday the 15th of May at 5 p.m. In order to enable an interactive dialogue, the submission of additional information in writing should be the exception rather than the rule. If the delegation submits additional information in writing within those 24 hours, such information should not exceed 1,500 words, and it should be timely, concise, and it should answer the concrete questions posed by the experts. Please also note that such information will also be published on the CEDAW website for the 85th session as it forms part of the public dialogue. Lack of replies or inadequate replies to questions raised by the committee may result in follow-up questions being asked, and eventually this may also be reflected in the concluding observations of the committee. I should also like to indicate that, if necessary, for appropriate time management, the delegation may be asked to limit its responses, should this become necessary due to time considerations. I will now call upon the experts who wish to pose questions under the various articles of the Convention. Experts are also reminded that they too should respect the time limits for questions. When the answers given to the questions are not sufficient, experts will be given an opportunity to ask follow-up questions for two minutes. We will start now by giving the floor first of all to Ms. Manalo, who is the country rapporteur, for her opening statement. This is for two minutes, and then we will start with questions relating to Articles 1 and 2 of the Convention, and I will give the floor to Ms. Ameline for that. But let's start with Ms. Manalo. You have the floor for two minutes. Muchas gracias, señora. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. Delegation of the People's Republic of China, headed by no less than Madam Wang Shai Wei. The speaker for the Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong and the speaker for the Special Administrative Region of Macau, members of the Chinese delegation, NGOs who are here present for, for participating in this dialogue, dear experts, ladies and gentlemen, as the Grand Country Rapporteur for the People's Republic of China dialogue this morning, I will just make one request from everyone, particularly the experts. I am greeting in behalf of all of you experts, already the delegation, so that we will gain time. Please don't repeat a welcome statement. Just go straight to the question and the follow-ups. In that way, we can accomplish as much as we can. So now I, you will permit me, Madam, now I'll give now the floor to Madam Nicole Ameline to be followed out immediately by a follow-up from Rangita da Silva. Thank you, Madam. Merci. Thank you, 
Thank you very much. And allow me also to extend a cordial greeting to the head of delegation and her accompanying delegation. Allow me also to welcome the presence of our dear colleague Jigxia on the committee. A warm welcome to all of you. I would like to recall that the organization of the Beijing Conference in 1995 marked the history of our world. 40 years on, this declaration remains a goal and because of its major impact on women's rights, the global COVID-19 crisis has reminded us all of just how significant our collective effort is. China, because of its leadership role in the world, bears particular responsibility in this respect. And we hope very much that this dialogue will allow us to achieve progress in the future. First of all, on peace building, women play a key role here and you are very involved in Resolution 1325 of the Security Council. Can I ask you whether a women peace and security plan is currently being envisaged in China in the framework of the implementation of the aforementioned resolution? In your international vision, there is a strategic plan with the UNFPA, which aims to strengthen national capacities through your cooperation policy. May I ask, in your initiative, the New Silk Roads, is there a specific section on promoting the status of women on the basis of CEDAW? Could you also please tell me whether, in order to strengthen the rule of law and the scope of the law, China is considering ratifying the optional protocol to CEDAW? You said that you are keen to strengthen your work towards achieving the SDGs. I would like to know how you make CEDAW and its provisions dovetail with your work on Agenda 2030. We welcome the new political and legislative energy that has focused on equality since 2014. There has been a lot of progress. Of course, there's the amendment to the criminal code and the improvement on legal aid. But regarding the 2022 law on strengthening the legal protection of the rights of women, this has brought about a revision of the 1992 Act in its Article 2, but it doesn't necessarily encompass all of the facets. What is the legislative process that is foreseen and how can you ensure legal convergence with your special administrative regions on this point? Secondly, on the implementation of the law, CEDAW is extremely concerned by the presence of intersecting discrimination, in particular, discrimination affecting vulnerable groups such as ethnic and religious minorities. Could you please reassure the committee and tell us whether or not the implementation of the law will make sure that women have a role to play, whatever their religious or ethnic belonging might be, and that these legislative measures will condemn any form of violations of women's rights? My third thought on this respect is that there are persistent inequalities in China. You said so yourself, madam, in particular in the world of labor. We don't think that the understanding of indirect discrimination is sufficient, really. And we think that at this stage, it is essential that we look at the overall impact of these measures on women's rights and especially in the world of work, but also in light of the family policy that you are pursuing to uh, increase the birth rate. The assessment of public policies is a key factor for progress. I would like to conclude on the effectiveness of law. You said that there are 300,000 women who might benefit from legal aid. 
Yet it seems that access to justice today, despite the simplified procedures that have been established, including in Hong Kong and Macau, it seems that access to justice is very difficult, that there are great inequalities between different areas, such as rural and urban areas, for instance. And of course, it is all the more harder for women to access justice. There needs to be extremely effective organization at this level, and we would welcome more information about what you're doing in this respect. On civil society, finally, civil society is broadly represented here today, and of course civil society is present in China. However, because there is no independent human rights body, it is absolutely vital that you provide information about the expansion of freedom of expression and the organization of the work of NGOs in the field of women's rights. Please provide further information about the current situation of women's rights defenders. How are they protected in light of universal principles? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ameline. I now give the floor to Ms. Aris for a few minutes. Distinguished representatives of the People's Republic of China, as you said, the basic law of Hong Kong SAR is its supreme law. A unique feature is its Article 39, which directly incorporates the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights as domestic law. Similarly, the basic law of Macau SAR ensures the domestic adaptation of both the ICCPR and the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This gives both SARs the entry point to adopt the CEDAW as a constitutional interpretive tool. In fact, the Court of Final Appeal, Hong Kong's Apex Court, has developed a growing substantive equality doctrine based on the CEDAW. Yet, the same court has narrowly interpreted the basic law to uphold discrimination against rural women and migrant domestic workers. We would like to know more about aligning the SAR's judicial interpretation to CEDAW's intersectional equality to address structural inequality. Your Excellencies, judges are the interpreters of the law. Will you consider the appointment of a more diverse court? My colleague here will raise this later, but since 1997, not a single Hong Kong woman has served as a permanent member on the Court of Final Appeals, the Apex Court. The Chinese Constitution, Article 48, enshrines equality between men and women. Article 49 reads, marriage, the family, and mother and child are protected by the state. Articles 48 and 49, read together, provides a protective paradigm. In current and future law and policy reform, including in the influential Supreme People's Court's guidelines, will you consider using an empowerment framework instead of merely a protective framework to interpret the supreme law of the land in keeping with the CEDAW? And finally, Your Excellencies, we agree with you about China's critical role on the global platform. In 2022, you released the important white paper on China's international development cooperation in the new era. It was issued by the State Council Information Office, and it identifies eight areas of international cooperation, including gender equality. This, indeed, is an important opportunity for transformation. Will the gender equality measures in international cooperation be aligned with both the letter and the spirit of substantive equality in the CEDAW? Thank you, Your Excellencies. Muchas gracias. Eh... Thank you very much. I now give the floor to the distinguished delegation for them to respond to the questions. I'd like to thank Madame Manalo as well as two members of the committee for her questions, for their questions. I'd like to invite the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the uh, 
Health Commission, as well as uh, other ministries, as well as representatives of Hong Kong and Macau to respond to those questions. Uh, uh, I, I would like to thank you for your questions. My name is Chi Da, I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I would like to address the question on peace building as well as the ratification of the OP. The first question, women's role in peace and security. Indeed, China has been a promoter of the women peace and security agenda. So far, we have sent more than 1,000 female peacekeepers contributing to the reconstruction and um, peace in the, the regions in conflict. Right now, we have more than 2,100 uh, peacekeepers from China, uh, female uh, troopers account, um, stands at 61, that is 3%. In terms of um, chief of staff and military observers, every year we deploy 16 female officers, uh, accounting for 19%. As for a peacekeeping training, China strictly abide by the UN uh, modules on training organizing pre-deployment training for the 33 years of peacekeeping. The Peacekeeping Affairs Center of the Ministry of Defense of China organized more than 120 sessions of pre-deployment intensive training for peacekeeping operations, which include protection of civilians, including women and children, as well as human rights protection, gender awareness, protection of schools, hospitals, and other important civilian facilities. Now turn to the op optional protocol. It is China's view that our primary uh, obligation under the convention lies with the government. If women's rights and interests are violated, the domestic resort should be uh, first and foremost be used. Since our accession to the convention, the Chinese government has fully implementing all the obligations under the convention. And we have developed a system protecting women's rights and interests and equality between men and, and women with a, a complete legal framework built up. Indeed, we, may, we can ensure the protection of women's rights and interests as well as the uh, implementation of the spirit of the convention. As for the OP on communications and inquiry, the government, the Chinese government will continue to study and follow up on the relevant practice. I would like to mention in passing The, the interplay between women's development and the 2030 agenda, indeed, that was um, touched upon by the, the head of delegation in her intervention. Thank you. I would like to thank you for your questions. I'm from the Social Development Committee of the MPC. I would like to talk about legal development. 
First of all, since the last construction, uh, in terms of emulate, eliminating gender-based uh, violence, what we have done. In terms of legislation, we have developed and revised the several pieces of law which have been um, referred to in the, the head of delegation's remarks. To recap, first of all, anti-domestic violence law, its in enforcement has changed the view that um, domestic violence only uh, is confined to uh, the family affairs. Uh, Anti-domestic violence has become a national uh, responsibility, codified and protected under the law. The second important law is the revised criminal law, severely punishing trafficking in women and children, specifies the buying and trafficking of women are punishable by criminal penalties and in step up penalty of um, rape, um, sexual assault on women, as well as um, forced um, indecency of children. Thirdly, we have overhauled the law on the protection of women's rights and interests, which was asked by the member. Indeed, um, uh, are thankful for your interest in this law. The women's law, in terms of fighting violence, has added the following contents. First, it provides for the uh, relevant, uh, the compulsory reporting of um, trafficking by the competent authorities. It has also comprehensive provision on the prevention and suppressing of sexual harassment. Thirdly, it expands the applicability of the uh, personal protective orders in order to protect uh, women in romantic relations and after divorce to, to protect them from violence during those periods. In your questions, you also um, give an interest to, to the definition of discrimination in law. Indeed, the, the spirit of the definition of discrimination in the co convention is fully reflected in the legal system protecting women. In the, the in the revised um, women's law, it is it says that the, the state will t take necessary measures to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women, and that includes both direct and indirect discrimination. And these pro legal provisions will be uh, truly enforced through law enforcement and judicial measures. In fighting employment, in employment, I would like to say a little bit more because we believe um, gender-based uh, discrimination at work fully uh, uh, is a big obstacle to women's potential. Therefore, in the new women's law, we stipulate that um, government at all levels uh, have the responsibility to prevent and ratify discrimination at workplace, cre create a level play field in terms of um, gender. And now employers in recruitment Uh, there might be discriminatory practices. There are specific prohibitive clauses on such um, practices. And we specify that the employer has the obligation to protect the rights and interests of female employees. And in terms of um, sexual uh, uh, gender-based discrimination, uh, has been incorporated in the um, labor protection supervision process.
And we have also introduced the public interest uh, litigation system uh, with um, the relevant legal responsibility uh, specified. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I'm from the uh, National Health Commission. I would like to talk about protecting women's uh, maternity rights. In June 2021, China published a document on optimizing maternity policy, promoting long-term uh, population development, introducing the three-child policy, and as well as supporting policies. Uh, and in August, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress revised the family planning law specifying the government will take um, fiscal, tax, education, housing, employment, supporting policies to relieve the family's burdens on child bearing and rearing and child care. In uh, July 2020, our commission, in, in conjunction with a number of ministries, provide a guideline um, on um, implementing these uh, pro-maternity um, measures, reducing, uh, helping to reducing the cost of childbearing and rearing education. And the newly revised women's law, Article 8 stipulates, we will have the opportunity to talk about maternity and reproductive rights, social protection and support for families when we get to Articles 12 and 13 of the Convention. So in order to ensure that all articles and issues are covered in due time, let me kindly ask you to focus your responses now on answering the specific questions that have been asked by the experts thus far. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairperson, um, may I invite my colleague from the Department of Justice in Hong Kong to address the questions about um, the legal status of CEDAW and um, the, uh, about the uh, situation about the women judges in Hong Kong. I'm Li Ha Yin from the Department of Justice of Hong Kong SAR. The basic law, in addition to Article 39, also protects the right to equality before the law under Article 25, and women enjoy the full protection of these rights in accordance with the law. The courts will and have taken into account the specific circumstances in Hong Kong and the facts of the and the facts and circumstances of each case in considering whether there is a case of unlawful discrimination. Although there is no single domestic legislation that seeks to implement the convention in its entirety, the provisions of the convention are implemented by a wide range of legislative and administrative measures such as the sex discrimination ordinance, the domestic and cohabitation relationships violence ordinance, the women's commission and the equal opportunities commission. These legislative and administrative measures are effective in guaranteeing the convention rights to women in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong SAR government will continue to monitor the implementation of the convention and review the relevant laws and policies from time to time to ensure full protection of human rights and to meet the needs of the society. On the gender, ration, gender ratio of the judiciary, um, Article 92 of the Basic Law provides that judges and other members of the judiciary of the Hong Kong SAR shall be chosen on the basis of their judicial and professional qualities and may be recruited from other common law jurisdictions. Gender is not a relevant consideration in judicial appointment. As of 31st of March 2023, there were 62 females, that is 37% out of a total of 166 judges and judicial officers. Thank you.
um, the uh, Macau SAR government would like to thank Ameline for your interest in judicial protection in Macau. Our government has um, judicial assistance committee. Um, this uh, committee came into force, came to play in 2013. And the applicants, uh, our accept applications are accepted irrespective of gender. The um, legal aid applications from 2013 April to the end of um, 2022, uh, that is applications for legal aid 3,817. 1,932 were raised by female applicants uh, involving um, application. Um, the violation of women's rights, uh, 600 cases, more than 500 on divorce, and 16, 617 on criminal cases, and three on uh, civil compensation and 14 to be uh, lodged with the court. And from the Information Office of the State Council, I'd like to talk about um, the National Human Rights In Institution and um, uh, Human Rights Defender. China does not have a single NHRI. However, we have a joint meeting uh, on the National Human Rights Action Plan, including more than 40 central level ministries and departments from uh, public security, the Supreme People's Court and prosecutor who dealt with a specific um, criminal cases violating women's rights. And the uh, petition office at the national level accepts um, complaints about violations of women's rights and uh, women's federations and um, women's committee at trade unions also accept complaints. Uh, women's federations has has um, one, two, three, three, eight reporting hotline. China's media has more than 210,000 registered journalists and and more than 10,000 relevant journalists. They're all human rights defenders through the media and through um, their own profession. They exercise the protection of women's rights. Thank you very much indeed. We are a little bit, we're running a little bit behind, so it's not really possible for me to uh, give the full follow up questions. Let me be very strict with time then. Ms. Manalo, you do have the floor for follow up questions, but just two minutes, please, Madam. I have to be very strict. Ms. Manalo, country reporter, two minutes, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, in the Opening statement this morning led by, by the leader of the Chinese delegation, she stated that an assessment of China's public policy has taken place. My question is as follows. Has, in the process of doing this assessment, has the private sector in China been consulted? And if so, what has been one contribution of the private sector to improving public policy? The second question is, have any of the NGOs been consulted to? And if so, what is one contribution that has imp helped improve public policy in China that affects and improves further the human rights of women? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manalo. Ms. Ameline, please, two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very briefly, let me thank the delegation for the answers. I'd just like to insist on the visibility of the CEDAW Convention. Could we be given an example of a uh, 
a case, a court case, where the CEDAW Convention has been expressly invoked and cited, that would be very useful. We would also stress legal convergence between the different administrative regions and, of course, uh, mainland China when it comes to further strengthening the role and place of the Convention as the law evolves in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let me now give the floor to the distinguished delegation for five minutes for them to answer these follow-up questions specifically. I would like to thank Madame Manalo and Madame Alanin for your questions. I would like to give the floor to our representatives from the NWCCW and SPC. I would like to thank you for the question. I am from the NWCCW. It is a great pleasure to see that the members of the committee are interested in the gender equality assessment of uh, regulations and laws. These are carried out at the national level, but also are carried out at uh, the local level in 31 provinces. For China, we are still in the process of uh, improving the review. In the initial composition of uh, the expert committee, we also incorporated research institutes, representatives from universities, lawyers who are interested in women's courts, and uh, representatives from social organizations. And when reviewing the organic law of a villages committee, we invited over 20 experts to express feedback on the laws and the regulations in China. Thank you. I would like to thank you for your question. I am from the Supreme People's Court regarding the applic applicability of the convention in China. The convention has been converted into domestic legislation in order to be enforced, enforced as the head of the delegation mentioned, a hundred laws and regulations in China, including civil code, women's protection law, incorporate these contents when dealing with the specific cases. We apply specific provisions of domestic law. These provisions are more targeted and uh, more operable and enforceable. And are better at uh, protecting women's interests, thus fulfilling our obligations under the convention. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Fichang. Thank you very much indeed for the distinguished delegation's responses. Let us now move to Articles 3 and 4 of the Convention, uh, National Machinery under 3 and Temporary Special Measures on 4. Let me now give the floor first of all then to uh, Ms Bandana Rana for five minutes for her to address Article 3. Ms Rana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. A very good morning to everyone, and particularly the high-level delegation. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our dear colleague, Jay Chia, from China, uh, and her contribution to this committee. I would like to begin by commending the State Party's efforts to establish numerous entities to address women's status and some introduction of policies and plans. But in spite of some progress, Chinese women's social status does not seem to have undergone significant changes. China is globally recognized as a rich, strong, and powerful country. I come from Nepal, a very small country next to China, and we from the small developing countries of the region, particularly look up to China for a stronger commitment to make notable headway in addressing the human rights of women nationally and regionally. Also because the most important historical foundation for women's rights, the Beijing Platform for Action, was sown in Beijing during the Fourth World Conference in 1995, which I had the opportunity to attend to. In this context, I will be covering Article 3 and addressing national machineries for the advancement of women. 
China has not yet established an independent national human rights institution, which was also mentioned in your opening statement, with a wide mandate to protect and promote women's rights. However, in its response to list of issues, China claims to have many national entities who are entrusted with the role of promoting human rights. You also mentioned this morning in your response, the development of a wide national human rights plan. With so many numerous efforts, wouldn't it be more cost effective and easier to better streamline gender and women's rights issues if you had a consolidated, one independent, fully resourced human rights commission? Hence, I continue to ask and would like to know if you will consider establishing a national human rights institution with a broad mandate in full compliance with the Paris principles. And now I would like to focus on the existing women's machineries. Th China has put in place a series of government departments and sectoral legislative frameworks that are mandated to promote the empowerment of women, notably National Work Working Committee on Children and Women, of wh from whom we just heard, and All China Women's Federation to protect women's rights, which is a welcome initiative. In 2020, NWCCW presented recommendations on improving mechanisms for gender equality-based review of laws and policies. You mentioned some of those in your statement. The newly revised law on the protection of rights and interests of women also has provisions on the review, further providing a legal basis for this work. Can you provide more specific and detailed insights into the output of this review and what changes amendments have been made? Given the critical role played by NWCCW, what are your plans to strengthen the institutional mechanisms and increase resources to the entity? Can you also share examples of how the cooperation with the civil society has been strengthened? In Hong Kong, there is an Equal Opportunity Commission and Women's Commission. In 2015-2016, the EOC conducted a consultation on the discrimination law review following which it provided numerous recommendations, including to set up law on sexual orientation discrimination, gender expression discrimination, discrimination based on physical characteristics, etc. Among those recommendations, Madam um, Member of Delegation, you mentioned only discrimination against breastfeeding is enacted in 2023. Can you inform us on the status of the other recommendations and how and when they will be implemented? In the case of the Women's Commission, which is called a central mechanism in the government's report, it lacks adequate power and resources. Since July 2022, the WOC is relocated to Home and the Youth Affairs Bureau from the Labor and Welfare Bureau. Please tell us of your efforts to strengthen the WOC in terms of its authority and budget, and also explain why it was necessary to relocate the WOC to Home and Youth Affairs Bureau. What is the added advantage? What is the criteria adopted for the adoption of the chair and commissioners to ensure inclusivity, effectiveness, and their independence? And this year, we have heard that the annual labor and women's rights and gender equality march could not take place, citing security reasons. Can you let the committee know on what grounds the International Women's Day March this year was canceled? And how will you ensure that the national security law does not violate women's rights. On data collection, it is encouraging to note that the newly amended law on the protection of rights and interests of women includes the importance of gender statistics. And in 2021, China adopted the National Program for Women's Development, 2021, 2030, which you mentioned in your statement, and that the policy of gender equality will be thoroughly implemented in this plan. How do you plan to ensure the availability of sex disaggregated data without which the monitoring and evaluation of the policy will be a challenge? And how will the diverse civil society be engaged in the implementation and monitoring of this policy? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let me now give the floor to Ms. Maya Morsi for her to address Article 4. Ms. Morsi, you have the floor for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I warmly welcome the distinguished delegation and the leadership and the presence of our colleague, Ji Chia. With respect to political empowerment and holding government positions, the committee commands the state party as more than half 
of the newly recruited civil servants are women. Representation in the judiciary are almost 32.7%. The challenge is that women occupy around 12% only of senior leadership positions and 4% women ministers. Women are involved in grassroots political organizations such as village and urban residence committees with 24.2% of the representatives in the highest echelons of the CPC. In the recent elections of the People's Congress at the country and township levels, women accounted for around 31% and 32% among elected deputies. And it, this is showing increase of 3.23 and, and 4.34 percentage points higher than that in the previous Congress, respectively. The committee command the state party regarding the organic law of the villagers committees, where the proportion of women members of the villagers residence committees now exceeds 40 percent also uh, as a great percentage. As it indicated in paragraph 36 that the electoral law of the National People's Congress and the Local People's Congresses, as revised in 2015, stipulates that deputies shall compromise an appropriate number of women who shall account for an increasingly larger percentage. Kindly provide more information about measures taken to define the appropriate representation of women and the timeline for achieving such representation. Kindly state the temporary special measures taken to accelerate the representations of women as ministers, academia, and senior positions and decision-making positions at all levels to acceler accelerate substantive equality for women, enhance the rights of ethnic and religious minority as well. Kindly provide more information on the temporary special measures and processes applied during the COVID pandemic to mothers, elderly, and disabled women. With the announced three child policy according to the Chinese law, women are legally entitled to a minimum of 98 days of paid maternity leave and extended to 158 days. Extending this leave without implementing supporting policies and legal protections is likely to further harm women's jobs, job prospects and maybe even put them off having children. Please provide information on protective temporary special measures regarding maternity in social policies as broad-based economic and social support policies, maternity insurance, public housing, and child care, capable of elevating the economic and fin financial burdens on mothers and also protect mothers in the workforce not to be left with no choice except to accept concessions like lower pay or block them from better job opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now return the floor to the distinguished delegation for her, their answers. I would like to thank the two experts for their questions. I would like to give the floor to the NWCCW NPC organization, the department, the Ministry of uh, civil affairs and uh, representatives from, from Hong Kong to answer these questions. I'm from the NWCCW. Madame Rana asked about how we advance the status of women in China. This is our goal. We all hope that we can have an independent human rights mechanism with uh, adequate resources and uh, well equipped to advance the status of women. Indeed, that is also the wish of uh, the Chinese government. However, we hope that men and women, government and the civil society, each citizen can all be involved to fulfill this goal. That is why we established the NWCCW. The purpose for establishing this commission is to mobilize resources from the whole society. We know that in terms of education for women, we've already seen very good progress. And also in terms of health, we've seen good progress. If we allocate resources of 4% of GDP, and allocate such resource to a single entity, 
it will be very difficult to do so because women's status and women's rights evolve uh, uh, very broad aspects. And that is why we need different departments to get involved. And through the budget of a different ministry and through specific policies of a different ministry, we can advance the status of women in China. And that is the current approach adopted in China. And in this process, the NWCCW acts as a coordinator to achieve the goal of a women's advance, advancement. And this is implemented through different ministries in their, their respective mandate. Multiple ministries have been involved in this process. For example, for anti-domestic violence, the Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Civil Affairs, Ministry of Education, all need to get involved. The NWCCW acts as a coordinator among these ministries. We organize annual me coordination meetings to address issues related. So we hope that the NWC NWCCW can play a bigger role in promoting gender equality and contribute to the cause, cause of a women's advancement. I'm from the NPC, from the Social Development Department. I would like to add to what has been said. I thank the expert for your interest in this topic. I would like to add that in China, Apart from government, the NPC is also involved in women's ad advancement. The NPC and its standing committee has legislative and also supervisory power over women's law. The social development department is responsible for supervising the enforcement of relevant laws regarding gender equality review of laws and the regulations. We know that the women's protection law came into effect on uh, in January this year. Therefore, there has been insufficient review regarding this law because it's still an early process. But we do fully solicit the opinion of women. From our experience, any laws related to women's rights and interest will enjoy the solicitation of opinion from women through five channels. First, we pay a lot of attention to the opinion of uh, women's federations. From the initial, the initial stage of a drafting of the law, the women's fe federations will be invited to provide their opinions. For example, for the revision of the women's protection law, the ACWF participated throughout the whole process, providing their views and opinions. The second channel is by soliciting opinion from women deputies to the People's Congresses, encouraging them to participate in seminars, talks, to express their points of, points of views. The third channel is by inviting female experts in, women, in women's rights and interests, and also female representatives from NGOs to understand their positions and opinions. The fourth channel is that in 31 provinces across the country, we establish the focal points. Through these focal points, we can invite local women to provide their opinions on the revision of the laws and the regulations. The fifth channel is that during the first reading and the second, uh, after the first reading and the second reading, the draft law will be published to invite opinion from uh, uh, women from all walks of life across the country. I thank you. I would like to thank you for your questions. I'm from the National Statistics Bureau. 
the Chinese government attaches great importance to collecting data to monitor the progress of women's development and gender equality. There are two channels or two avenues. First, based on the National Program for Women's Development, survey and the collection of data has been carried out annually. Regarding the goals of the program, we established 65 indicators to collect data from 30 diff different departments. All these indicators are related to women's rights and interests. Every year, we compile and publish the annual monitoring report on the National Program for Women's Development. We also draft statistical reports on women and the children's status, and all these reports will be published to the, uh, the whole society. Second, to enhance gender equality monitoring, the statistical authorities of China adopted a plan for sex desegregated mo uh, monitoring plan, in in incorporating nine areas such as health and education and population development. We also established 1,300 uh, indicators for this purpose. During Mr. M Madame Huang's statement, she uh, referred to a lot of statistics which can reflect women's development in China. Thank you. I will first respond to the questions on our Women's Commission in Hong Kong, and then I will pass the floor to my colleagues to address the questions of the Equals of the Equal Opportunities Commission and about the national security law. Um, about the Women's Commission in Hong Kong, it is tasked to advise the government on strategies for the development and advancement of women in Hong Kong in the long term. And um, the Hong Kong SAR has adopted a three-pronged st strategy as supported by the Women's Commission, Name, namely the provision of an enabling environment, empowerment of women through capacity building, and public education. And in fact, the uh, Women's Commission has created a gender mainstreaming checklist, which assists the government to um, systematically adopt gender mainstreaming by answering a series of straightforward questions. And so far, um, uh, all government departments have to refer to this checklist and apply gender mainstreaming when formulating major government policies and initiatives. And so far, we have reviewed over 1,400 policy papers and have referred to the um, checklist before relevant policies and initiatives are implemented. And regarding resources, as I have uh, mentioned in my opening statement, uh, we have um, increased the um, resources for, for uh, promoting uh, women benefit uh, through the establishment of a Women Empowerment Fund. And we have set aside 100 million Hong Kong dollars for this fund. And we aim to um, uh, have a funding of uh, 20 million Hong Kong dollars each year to subsidize women organizations and NGOs um, to, to apply for uh, launching appropriate projects to support women. And may I then uh, pass the floor to my colleagues. Microphone, please. This is Kathy Lee from, from the Constitutional and Mainland Affairs Bureau of the HKSAR government. The HKSAR government, in conjunction with the EOC, reviews the operation of the four anti-discrimination ordinances on a regular basis and put forward legislative proposals where necessary. The government enacted the Discrimination Legislation Miscellaneous Amendments Ordinance 2020 in June 2020 to take forward eight of the EOC's recommendations with a view to enhancing protection against discrimination and harassment under the four anti-discrimination ordinances, which includes prohibiting such acts as discrimination of breastfeeding women, as well as harassment between participants in a common workplace. The government also separately introduced a legislative proposal to, am to amend the sex discrimination ordinance to provide protection against harassment of breastfeeding women, 
The subject says Discrimination Amendment Ordinance 2021 was passed by the Legislative Council in March 2021 to strengthen the legal protection for breastfeeding women, whereby discrimination and harassment on the ground of breastfeeding are prohibited with effect from June 2021. The government will examine the UOC's other recommendations, taking into account the actual situation of Hong Kong while maintaining close communication with the EOC. I'm from the Security, Security Bureau of the HKSL government. Regarding members' comments on the national security law, the fundamental rights and freedoms of the residents in the Hong Kong SAR are guaranteed at the constitutional level in Chapter 3 of the Basic Law. Article 4 of the Hong Kong National Security Law clearly stipulates that human rights shall be respected and protected in safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong SAR. The rights and freedoms which the residents of the Hong Kong SAR enjoy under the basic law and the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights as applied to Hong Kong shall be protected in accordance with the law. Any measures or enforcement actions taken under the Hong Kong National Security Law must observe the above principle. Therefore, the rights and freedoms under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women would be fully protected in Hong Kong. Regarding members' comments on the International Women's Day procession, on the 4th of March 2023, the police received a notification from an organization that a public order event would not be held. The police respect the decision of the organizer and will not comment further on a particular case. Upon receipt of a notification of a public order event under the public order ordinance, the police will carefully consider various factors before making a professional assessment. The commissioner of police can impose conditions that are reasonable and proportionate in the interest of national security, public safety, public order, or protection of rights and freedom of others. Organizers may appeal to the statutory appeal board on public meetings and processions chaired by a former judge. The appeal board's decision is also amenable to the challenge of judicial review. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your interest in women's participation in politics. Just now, just as mentioned, many measures concerning women's participation in politics women has made huge strides. There are many channels for women's participation in uh, the CPC organs, in the NPCs, in the judiciary, in the procuratorates. Women held, uh, can hold positions or even senior positions. For example, in China, they stipulated the parties' congresses uh, representation of women uh, should not be lower than uh, the uh, local uh, level. And also in the NPC uh, various uh, levels, the new women's law on the uh, basis of the previous version further requires that there should be relevant women's participation and women's uh, representation and also the protection of their rights. I can cite some figures. In 2013, in the 12 NPCs, 2,900 deputies, uh, there were 699 women. And in the 14th NPC, uh, altogether 2,977 uh, deputies, there were 790 women. And when the total number reduced by 10, and the women's participation actually increased by 91 positions. And also, in provincial and municipal levels, the staffing of the uh, management teams, uh, women is also are also represented. We also have required representation level, and it's also required that if there are 
not enough candidates locally than uh, other regions can send relative candidates or we can leave the positions vacant for candidates. We also require that in uh, all official and management teams, half of the positions should be held by women. For uh, the statistics, we have also an annual review system so as to advance uh, the achievement of such goals. As to your questions on senior positions held by women, in the selection and training of cadres, we have the uh, gradual and uh, tiered system, so we pay high attention to training and selecting female officials. As you know, China has gradually raised the level of education of women, and more women are now holding high, higher and senior positions, in, uh, especially in civil servants teams. We hope that uh, with these advancements and also with the changing of social per uh, the, uh, the perception in the society, more women will be able to hold uh, senior positions, and we are optimistic about that. I'd like to thank you for your questions. I come from the Civil Affairs Department and would like to address your question on uh, women's participation and proportion in residence committees and villages committees. These were already addressed and I will not talk about them. And I will uh, talk about self-governance in rural areas. Uh, we have three measures. First, to encourage women to stand for election to the, the villages committee. And through the uh, dedicated education, uh, dedicated election to raise their proportion. Two, to organize women to participate in the formulation of village customs and rules and regulations. Uh, in articles. 14, first of all, and 17 at the beginning. So we will ask you for that information when we get to those articles. Now I will give the floor back to the head of delegation so that they might continue responding. The interpreters apologize, we missed the beginning because of the, the chair's mic wasn't on. Oh. Uh, Madam Rana, raise the question on the relationship between the NWCCW and other departments. Just now, our member in also touched upon this issue, Madam Guoye. Actually, on uh, for the 680 million women, the NWCCW exercise a very efficient role. It leveraged more than 60 ministries to solve macro problems, but also can also solve problems at a micro level. Just now, I introduced the National Programme for Women's Development, eight areas, 75 objectives, 90, more than 90 measures, and all those cannot be uh, just uh, implemented by one uh, organ, because this work is uh, uh, in uh, overarching and in every aspect of our life. So, for example, on one stage, on for example, on some problems such as uh, domestic violence or legislation or law enforcement, we can use this mechanism to leverage the public security organs and other law enforcement organs to solve relevant problems. For example, for example, on 
uh, sentencing on other judicial problems, we can liaise with the Supreme Court or uh, the judiciary organs. And when it comes to shelters, we can also liaise with the civil service, civil uh, affairs department. So this working mechanism, this joint action mechanism is very efficient and it's very relevant to the protection of women's rights and interests. Thank you very much. We are running behind and we do need to move on, so I'm afraid we won't have time for follow-up questions at this point. So I am very well grateful to the distinguished delegation for the responses provided thus far. And we will now move on to Articles 5 and 6 of the Convention. We will speak first of all about Articles 5 on uh, stereotypical stereotypes and violence against women. And then we will talk about Article 6, so trafficking and uh, prostitution. So I would like to give the floor first of all to address the issue of stereotypes. Ms. Bethel, you have the floor for three minutes, Ms. Bethel. Good morning and thank you, Chair. I would also like to acknowledge the contribution and work of Ms. Ji Jia to this CEDAW committee. I will address gender stereotypes and harmful practices. Madam Head of Delegation, I will refer to paragraph four of the State Party's response to the list of issues. We take note of the State Party's efforts in implementing the decision of the CPC Central Committee and the State Council to take comprehensive measures to reduce sex ratio at birth, including harsh punishment on agencies and employees conducting fetal sex identification for non-medical purposes or sex selective abortion. Further, social advocacy campaigns have been carried out to eradicate the prejudices of sun preference and male superiority and many other areas of prejudice. Um, please advise us as to the date or commencement of this said decision and as to whether it is a policy with an action plan or a law. It's not clear. Please provide us with a time frame and roadmap for the implementation of this decision. Further, what CEDAW responsive and gender responsive guidelines, targets, or other regulatory templates exist to provide appropriate frameworks for persons responsible for this realization of this decision in compliance with CEDAW principles and objectives? In regard to sex identification and sex selection on a, as a harmful practice, the state party has promulgated a series of regulations and laws to have sex identifying ultrasounds and sex select sex selective abortions as illegal. In 2016, the regulation on prohibiting fetal sex identification and sex selective termination of, of pregnancy for non-medical purposes was amended and promulgated. An information management system for illegal fetal sex determination and sex selective abortion has been established for strengthening the, the dynamic management of relevant cases and offenders. Legislative bans on the use of ultrasound and abortion for the purpose of sex selection send an important normative signal. Please elaborate for us on the enforcement of these regulations in order to determine the real and substantive effects of these policies and laws. I now turn to shackling of women and girls. Alternative sources reveal that women and girls in China have, who have psychosocial disabilities, mental health conditions, are shackled that is chained or locked in confined areas or spaces due to stigma or lack of accessible community services. What steps has the state party taken to eliminate this practice of shackling, particularly on women and girls with psychosocial disabilities? What measures has the Chinese government taken to develop other measures to address this harmful practice? In regard to the media, at paragraph 19 to the response of list of issues, you state the following, publicity campaigns have been initiated to promote the progress and the advancement of women and women's image in the new era. Are women actively engaged in confronting gender stereotyping in the media and the evaluation process of determining progress in this area? Are women actively engaged in production of radio and television content and participation in the programs with a view to combating gender stereotypes? 
And finally, I look at advertising. Again, in your response to the list of issues at paragraph 20, you indicate that measures have been taken to provide more channels for, for women to voice their opinions and concerns. Is there a legal framework or policy to combat gender stereotyping in advertising? Finally, what if any are the administrative sanctions for public and private sector companies that sexualize women and girls in the media and advertising? Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Genoveva Tisheva for three minutes to discuss issues of violence. You have the floor, Ms. Tisheva. Madam Chair, I would like to welcome the representatives of the government of China uh, to this dialogue uh, and also to express uh, how honored I am to be able to work with Ms. Jia from China. Uh, we commend you, uh, State Party, for the achievements in laws and policies related to gender equality, and specifically in the sphere of protection from violence against women, on your law on protection of women's rights and interests, the new one, and the anti uh, domestic violence law, and especially with the latest amendments. I will highlight some major problematic areas in the sphere of gender based violence against women. First of all, I would like to remind that the CEDAW Convention complemented by its jurisprudence, particularly General Recommendation 35 updating General Recommendation 19 on gender-based violence, requires from the state party to protect women against gender-based violence in cases it is perpetrated by private persons on organization, but also to refrain from engaging in acts of gender-based violence against women through its public authorities and institutions. Both elements of state responsibilities are important, but state obligation not to commit violence is crucial and monitored by CEDAW. There is data that representatives of police and other state institutions in China exert themselves gender-based violence, sexual violence, and harassment against women members of organizations of human rights and women's rights defenders, against women in detention, and these acts go unpunished. And on the other hand, the recent changes of the law I mentioned on protection of women's rights extend the concept and definition of discrimination against women and the scope of protection. Please provide information about the number and status of investigation of, uh, and complaints against police representatives for sexual violence, including rape, for excessive use of force, about the outcome and sanctions applied. What are the complaints mechanisms available to women? How can be the amended law mentioned above, the new one, be used in such cases by the prosecution authorities for filing, as you mentioned, public interest law lawsuits, and also for prevention of revictimization of women? Concerning the anti-domestic violence law, the law apparently still does not cover all cases of inter-personal um, violence. Uh, and former such relations are not all forms of economic violence, economic control and negligence. The implementation is still hampered by the lack of training of police, of the judiciary, and also lack of training and capacity building of the persons working in services for women victims, including shelters. The uneven devel development of work against domestic violence, as you also mentioned, in different regions is also a serious problem. There is not awareness about the law and about the opportunities for protection services and shelters, which is a serious problem. There is data that in many cases, the judges apply gender stereotyping and does not give equal weight to women's testimony, evidence, and requests. And for example, in assessing domestic violence during divorce cases, in some courts, over 80% of women, women's domestic violence claims are rejected. My question, uh, when will you broaden the scope of protection, including also all hypotheses, all hypotheses of inter, uh, interpersonal intimate partner violence in the definition of the law? How do you evaluate the effectiveness of the conducted training for professionals so far on the anti-domestic violence law? And please explain when are you planning to ensure regular mandatory training for all professionals involved in the law implementation and in all regions, police, judiciary, social operators, health professionals, and give a timeline for introducing such programs. And please provide information about the number, uh, maybe in writing, about the number of claims for domestic violence discontinued and rejected 
claims by women uh, rejected by court in the last year 2022 compared to the total number of claims both in civil and penal procedures and finally women with disabilities from minorities women refugees and asylum seekers lbtiq women and other groups of women facing multiple discrimination have additional difficulties in accessing the rights to protection from gender-based violence how does the state party respond through law and policies to the need to recognize the rights to protection for these groups and ensure effective protection from gender-based violence access to justice and redress namely in the absence of a national asylum law how do women refugees and asylum seekers avail themselves of protection by the anti-domestic violence law but also by the law on protection of the rights of women which is pro progressive and uh, acting on the territory thank you very much my thanks to Mr. Sheva, and I give the floor to Ms. Lenati for her to cover Article 6 for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I joined um, my colleagues in warmly welcoming uh, all members of the delegation. So I will be addressing Article 6 on trafficking and exploitation of prostitution. The committee comments. Um, the government for providing updated information on the prevalence of trafficking in persons uh, throughout the territory of the state party. It is also commendable that China has revised the criminal law and increased criminal penalties for traffickers. Could you please provide info on the size of penalties issued to traffickers under the new law? Also, unfortunately, there is no information in China State Report on the assistance available to victims of trafficking. What access to assistance, rehabilitation, and reintegration are available for victims of trafficking? And how many shelters and rehabilitation services are available uh, to female victims of trafficking? How many foreign victims of trafficking received permission to stay in China with or without the willingness to cooperate uh, with the police as witnesses. There is information on increasing numbers of trafficking in women with disabilities. It's not only in China. Analysis on judicial cases on trafficking in women from 2017 to 2020 shows that 20%, around 20% of trafficked women in China had disabilities mostly intellectual or psychosocial disabilities. What has been done to address this comparably new form of trafficking? Now on migrant domestic workers and possible trafficking cases. By 2021, there were around 340,000 migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong, most coming from Southeast Asia and South Asia, predominantly, of course, female. In 2021, 2,833 applications were rejected, which is nine times more than the previous year. The rejections were based on mainly unfounded so-called job hoping uh, uh, practice. But the radical reduction of legal way of migration increases flow and opens channels for illegal migration and illegal domestic work, which leads, leads, will lead to cases of human trafficking, and especially in this case, women, in all stages of migration. Could you please kindly comment on this recent policy? China's criminal law, as I understand, has no special legislation on different forms of human trafficking. The Article 240 stipulates that the crime of abducting and trafficking in women and children uh, uh, takes place in, in, in criminal law. The offense does not extend to the cases, for example, of forced marriages. And this brings me to address here now North Korean female defectors. North Korean female defectors in China are vul vulnerable to deportation back to North Korea just because their status is illegal. As a result, children of North Korean women 
who have Chinese fathers and born in China also face a range of legal challenges. Legally registering a child born to defector from North Korea is impossible, even uh, impossible without putting the mother at risk of exposure and reformation by China, even if it's known that a child was born out of forced marriage as one form of trafficking. Often, the registration of these children by Chinese fathers only occurs after the North Korean mothers has fled to South Korea or been deported back to North Korea. Mothers are frequently reported as missing or deceased, which had, has significantly legal consequences for mothers' efforts to reunite with their children in South Korea. This ultimately deprives women of their motherhood and deprives children to be recognized by both parents, giving advantage to Chinese fathers as the only legal parent. How many children, I wonder, are registered as having undocumented North Korean women as their mothers? Maybe you have such uh, information. How many North Korean escapees forcibly are repatriated to the DPRK and, the, uh, and who left their children in China by their own will or forcibly. Finally, the most important question, what are the laws and policies in China to grant refugee status to North Korean females and their children in its territory? Now, in regards to Uyghur population in China, in the light of Article 6 of the CEDAW Convention, the media and research have shown that forced labor and sexual violence has taken place in so-called vocational tra training centers throughout the Uyghur region where forced labor is practiced uh, for, in terms of uh, women too. Also, it seems that the government promotes forced marriages between Uyghur women and Chinese men as some tool of intended assimilation. Can you please just comment on female Uyghur situation in attention on vocational centers and in regards of possible forced marriages? That would be really appreciated. Now I turn uh, to uh, uh, exploitation of prostitution, just a few sentences. The second and fourth uh, paragraphs of Article 4 of the prohibiting prostitution and whoring were abolished. But what does it mean in, in, the, uh, in the practice? Differently from China, prostitution is legal in Macau and counts tens of thousands of women in prostitution, but nevertheless faces harsh police violence. Last year in September, Macau police have de uh, detected a prostitution ring, arrested nine suspected members of the syndicate and 26 women in prostitution, sex workers. If it is a war against organized prostitution, which is illegal in Macau, then my question is, what has been done to reduce the demand side for prostitution in order to reduce clientele for buying sex. So thank you very much. And these are my questions under Article 6. And um, uh, Your Excellency, I just um, ask your permission. Senora Leinarte. Ms. Leinarte, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I've had to also cut off other speakers. So if I can just warmly ask colleagues uh, to try and squeeze your comments into the allotted speaking time, because otherwise we're really not going to accommodate everybody. Um, these are very, very relevant questions that of course uh, do need to be raised in the dialogue, but let's please make care of this effort to stick to our allotted time. Let me now give the floor to the distinguished delegation for them to answer, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, the three members for your questions. 
I would like to invite our members, uh, colleagues from the Ministry of Public Security, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Civil Affairs, representatives from uh, Macau and Hong Kong, and Ministry of United Front Work and National Health Commission. Thank you very much for Bethel's question. I'm from National Health Commission about um, birth rate at sex, a sex rate at birth and uh, fighting sex selection and identification. There are specific laws in China, population and family planning law promulgated in 2010 provides prohibit prohibition on and discrimination and abuse of um, abandoning female infant and their mothers. And China opposed all forms of um, forced abortion and the population and law provides that all governments and their staff while doing family planning related work has to um, do the work in a civilized way in accordance with the law and the legitimate rights of the population cannot be infringed on. Um, in terms of um, sex ratio at the birth, it is an issue atta tackled by um, several agencies in China led by National Health Commission, prohibiting um, medically unnecessary sex identification, fetal identification, and uh, selective uh, sex selective abortion. And there are special campaigns on um, these practices. And on, we have a step up publicity on gender equality using International Population Day, International Girls Day, and International Families Day with all those information campaign, gender equality has been given great publicity and the sex ratio at birth since last consideration that is in 2040 was 115.9 reduced to now 108.3 per 100,000. Um, showing the effectiveness, effectiveness of the enforcement of the relevant laws. Thank you for questions. I'm from the Ministry of Public Security. First of all, on the question how to protect the rights of women and girls with disabilities. in order to respond to trafficking in women both at home and abroad, fighting the crime of trafficking in persons, protecting the rights and interests of citizens, the Chinese government has developed the National Action Plan 2020 to 2023 against trafficking in persons. The government will continue to fight trafficking in women and girls and given special attention to protecting vulnerable groups, including women and children, fighting crimes as buying, selling, trafficking, adopting of women and girls, including those with intellectual and um, uh, psychological disabilities, and also providing proper settlement and accommodation rehabilitation for those victims with disabilities. We're protecting the legitimate rights of um, women and girls with intellectual and psychological disabilities as victims of trafficking persons and the law on public order as and the relevant laws have been um, constitutes a restriction, a legal uh, definition of restriction of personal freedom. All such acts are punishable by law. Thank you. Secondly, on 
the enforcement of the anti-domestic violence law by the public security organs. The ADV law in China has specific uh, provision on the res responsibility of the public security organs in terms of fighting, stopping, and providing remedies. First of all, prevention of anti-domestic violence. For instance, um, legal campaigns on the law, awareness raising, including how to use the law to protect one's own rights and interests. And secondly, providing ways of mediation and settlement of family disputes to, to prevent such disputes from escalating into domestic violence. Thirdly, for families which have shown indicia of this domestic violence with reports to the public security organ and other authorities, special attention has been given to, and these measures have been play, um, has played an effective role in prevention of domestic violence. And secondly, the the suppressing of domestic violence by the public security organs. For the reported cases, the public security organs will dispatch police immediately to curb domestic violence and help the victims to seek medical help and examine the injuries. For incapacitated persons, who have suffered serious injuries from uh, domestic, domestic violence and those who do not have uh, carers, we report these cases to the civil affairs department to resettle them in temporary shelter or in other social service institutions to take care of these, these people. At the same time, for acts of domestic violence, these acts will be dealt with in accordance with the law. And in light of the specific circumstances, criticism, disciplinary actions, or written warning will be given to the perpetrators. And will also uh, impose relevant sanctions. Serious cases of domestic violence will be dealt with the, with the harsh punishment for beating, battering, manslaughter, abuse, and other especially serious cases. These cases will be dealt with the, a zero tolerance approach. Third, we help the people's courts to enforce personal safety protection orders since the adoption of the domestic violence law, the public security organs have helped uh, 18,000 people uh, to benefit from the protection orders. Fourth, for all police um, of uh, the public security organs, domestic violence related trainings have been provided. Domestic violence law has been incorporated into the daily training, uh, da daily tra training sessions for the poli police to enhance their capability to deal with the cases of uh, domestic violence cases. That is the end of my answer to this question. Regarding the third question. That is human trafficking. To combat trafficking of women and children, China has done the following. The Chinese government attaches great importance to anti-trafficking and takes a zero tolerance stance against the trafficking. We use multi departmental collaboration 
and mobilize the whole society and participate in international cooperation to combat trafficking, especially cross-border trafficking of women and children. First, we continue to improve relevant laws and regulations on anti-trafficking measures. Since 2018, we have uh, for three times renewed and developed the action plan for combating trafficking. At the same time, we also revised the criminal law and the women's protection law, the minors protection law. Just now, my colleague from the National People's Congress already elaborated on this point on these points, so I will not repeat here. Second, we've stepped up efforts to combat trafficking. For many years, the Chinese government has been engaged in anti-trafficking efforts. For missing children, underage girls and uh, women suspected of uh, being trafficked, we establish fast track identification measures to is to establish the relevant uh, established cases in order to carry out investigation at the same time we've enhanced the penalties for these cases especially for all those involved in trafficking and those suspected of uh, raping and including buyers of a trafficked person we maximize the penalties for all those involved in trafficking cases the government not only tackles new cases of trafficking and take zero stance up approach towards these cases, we also pay high attention to backlogs of trafficking cases. In 2021, we carried out a campaign uh, a called, uh, which reunites missing children with their family. We tackled many backlogs, a uh, backlog of cases of uh, trafficking of children. These efforts have seen good results. Trafficking of uh, women and children are now declining. During the opening speech of uh, the head of a de dedication, specific statistics have been provided on the achievements in anti-trafficking. Third, we mobilize the whole society to combat trafficking. Fourth, we have been carrying out uh, international cooperation currently. The Chinese government is working with uh, 113 countries. We've established a liaison mechanism with them in order to carry out a close cooperation to tackle trafficking cases. We have a, a cooperation mechanism with 54 law enforcement departments of other countries. In Guangxi and Yunnan provinces, we also established a joint anti-trafficking uh, uh, offices at the border, especially with uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam. Agreements have been signed to promote our joint efforts to combat cross-border trafficking, selling and buying of persons. Last. I wish to answer questions related to custody and education system. On 28th of December 2019, the NPC Standing Committee decided to abolish the custody and education system and issued a decision, issued a decision uh, regarding to this issue. By doing so, the system of custody and education for persons involved in prosecution have been abolished. That is the end of my answer. Thank you. 
I wish to thank you for your questions. I wish to answer questions related to social psycho uh, health services in rural areas. In recent years, the Chinese government has made has taken two measures. First, we've been enhancing psychosocial services and also carrying out assessment and monitoring of these services. Second, we've been promoting the relevant service stations in counties, townships, villages, and sub-districts to provide mental, psychological, and social services in rural areas by the end of a 2022, we've established uh, 29,000 stations. Over 70,000 professional staff are at these stations providing services to people in, uh, in rural areas. Thank you. I'm from the Ministry of Justice. Just now, we've heard some questions related to domestic violence regarding legal aid to victims of domestic violence and trafficking. China attaches great importance to protecting the legal rights and interests of women to allow women to enjoy equal protection under the law. We prioritize legal aid to women helping women, including victims of domestic violence and trafficking, to access convenient, efficient, and universal legal aid services. We've adopted the following measures. First, we provide uh, application, smooth application channels for legal aid through different entities, hotlines, and online portals. Women can seek legal aid, legal advisory, and also uh, as assistance with uh, relevant uh, le legal procedures. We've established 3,000 legal aid entities nationwide, 70,000 legal aid stations nationwide. And we have also leveraged women federations at different levels to provide services. Second, we've streamlined the application procedures for legal aid. Some women have asked for legal aid because of financial hardship. They no longer need to prove their financial situation. And for victims of domestic violence, we do not need them to prove their financial status. And, and third, we also focus on improving the quality of legal aid provided to women. We appoint point those professionals and the lawyers who are familiar with the relevant cases to provide legal aid to women. I have a set of st statistics to share with the, the committee. In 2022, legal aid entities in China dealt with the uh, 288,000 cases providing assistance to 318,000 women, including 8,000 women who have suffered from domestic violence. This helped to provide, uh, we also helped to provide legal advice to uh, 1.95 million women. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I'm from the Ministry of uh, Civil Affairs. I would like to answer questions related to shelter for vi victims of uh, domestic violence. Civil Affairs departments are in charge of uh, guiding shelter and relevant institutions in providing temporary shelter to victims of domestic violence. Governments at a county level or above that level can establish shelter shelters in um, the urban areas. Now we've established 
services covering both urban and rural areas, providing food, accommodation, medical, medical services to the victims. When appropriate, we also provide counseling and uh, legal advice to the victims. I also wish to answer questions related to rescue for victims of uh, trafficking. Civil Affairs departments work with uh, the police to provide timely assistance to victims of uh, trafficking. For those who have been referred to us by the police, depending on their specific situation, assistance will be provided to these victims. For those with the disease, medical, atten uh, medical attention will be given immediately. And for those with a clear identification, returning, uh, they, these people will be helped to return to homes for those whose identification are unknown. Family tracing services will be, be provided to help them to, to find their family. And for those whose identity cannot be substantiated, we will work with the police to provide resettlement to these people. Thank you. Links uh, to address two questions about Hong Kong. The first one is about uh, trafficking of women, and the second question is about foreign domestic helpers. Members, um, for the comments, I'm from the Security Bureau of the HKSAR government. Regarding trafficking of women, Hong Kong has a well-established legislative framework with over 50 legal provisions against various trafficking in person conducts. This forms a comprehensive package of safeguards comparable to composite TIP laws in other jurisdictions. Some of the offenses attract penalty of up to life imprisonment. Over the years, the number of TIP victims identified has been low, which reflects that TIP is never a prevalent problem in Hong Kong, and there has never been any sign that Hong Kong is being actively used by syndicates as a destination or transit point for TIP. Thank you, Chair. I'm from uh, Labor Department of the Hong Kong SAR government. Under the prevailing policy, an application for change of employer of foreign domestic helper in Hong Kong within the two year contract period will normally not be approved, save for the exceptional circumstances. Example of these exceptional circumstances are migration of the original employer or abuse or exploitation experienced by the foreign domestic helper. We wish to reiterate that there is no change to the above prevailing policy and the consideration therein. The Hong Kong SAR government is devising the code of practice to require employment agencies to clearly explain the above prevailing policies to foreign domestic helper job cities so as to protect both the interests of foreign domestic helper and their employer. Thank you. I thank Madame Leonard for your question to Macau. According to current law in Macau, although prostitution prostitution does not constitute criminal offense, but we do combat relevant offenses when a person is in a dangerous situation. Uh, we deal with the, the broker, brokering of a prostitution. Some people exploit other people to benefit from a prostitution, and those can be punishable by law with uh, imprisonment from one to five years. Six, um, sexual dealing with uh, people under the age of 18 can be punishable by law for imprisonment over three years. Seducing or suggesting for sexual trade in public places can also be punishable with a fine of uh, 5,000 
we strictly deal with the brokerage of a prostitution or sexual sex trade with uh, underage persons. Law enforcement has been actually carrying out relevant campaigns and also investigate in women who are in the business of a prostitution to make sure that they have not been sexually exploited. Between 2018 to 2022, we've contacted over 1,300 such campaigns and investigated over 2,900 persons involved. We wish to stress that the life, safety, health of all women should be equally protected under the laws of the Macau SAR. If any cases have been identified where women have been exploited or are a dangerous situation, the government will provide necessary assistance, including protection measures by the police. We also provide accommodation and other assistance to help them to return to where they, they are from. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'd like to address questions by Madame Leinert on uh, women from Korea and on DPRK. I think these are issues of different natures. First, the legal status of such women and their treatment on the one hand, and on the other hand, these trafficked women, their marriage and their children. I think the two might not be necessarily have a causal effect, but I think the authorities of civil affairs will introduce our position on such a marriage legal or illegal on our position on such issue, including on the issue of children born out of uh, such marriage. First of all, in China, China is a party to the Refugee Convention. And in accordance with the definition and our interpretation, we believe that those who came for economic reasons, they are not qualified as refugees. So you mentioned many North Korean women, they came to China and most of them were of an econo for economic reasons. So we believe that this not pertains to a TIP issue. So we don't have a relevant data or statistics in this regard. At the same time, I'd like to clarify also that the Chinese government, when treating these women, we use our domestic law as well as the international law, in particular, the humanitarian principle to appropriately address these issues. These North Korean women who entered illegally in China. So we also hope that the United Nations, including the human rights bodies, will also act in accordance with the UN Charter's purposes and principles to have an objective view on such situation and to uh, impartially discharge their duties. In particular, to respect China's decision in accordance with our law and uh, the judicial decisions made to that end. We, I just mentioned that we follow the principle of humanitarianism. I should like to invite the colleague from the Civil Affairs Department for further elaboration. I thank you for your questions. 
I come from the civil affairs department. Uh, when protecting the uh, brides from foreign nationalities, we uh, take the following measures. First, to share information, to enhance departmental information exchange on registration of uh, foreign uh, or marriage with foreign nationals. We also strengthen registration and strengthen the cooperation among local governments and to raise awareness on risks pertaining to transnational or cross uh, uh, mixed marriages. So we also strengthen cooperation in this regard. We also raise awareness those who have not yet entered into the um, marriage registration procedure, but who already have children with Chinese nationals or those who do not have a criminal record or do not have livelihood in China, we guide them to apply for marriage registration. And some people, they are in partnership, but without a formal marriage. But uh, if they are in a illegal uh, activities, they will be sent back to their country. I come from the United Front, and I will address questions on uh, rights and interests of Uyghur women. Just as we repeatedly clarified, the, there, uh, there is no re-education camp in China. The education and vocational schools and centers were established according to our regulations to of de-regulizing uh, extremism so that those who, with minor offenses can receive uh, education and be rehabilitated. These uh, vocational centers are not centers that deprive people of their liberty. The activities educational or other activities include learning language or helping the students to uh, receive information, to have legal knowledge, know about the laws and regulations and help these students to learn the national law and to distinguish uh, law violating activities and to also teach them vocational skills so as to help them to seek employment and to find livelihood and to uh, realize a better life. Uh, this is also a de-radicalization effort to root out erroneous religious rhetoric and to rectify such rhetoric so as to uh, combat the negative effect of uh, extremism. The vocational training uh, conducted in these centers are for the students uh, to learn, to practice. So uh, that is why maybe uh, foreign media thought that it was forced labor. But however, these were, uh, for example, activities of uh, catering, baking, or sometimes they bake cakes for their daily use. And some students also uh, cut hair for other students and uh, uh, exercise their skills as hairdressers. So this is completely different uh, in nature from uh, profit earning uh, activities. I'd like also to tell you that uh, personal freedom was guaranteed in these centers. During uh, 
uh, they are learning, the students, uh, they, their rights uh, are guaranteed. There is no uh, ill treatment or any, uh, any corporate punishment uh, or abuse or no such uh, acts uh, against the students. The students retained their right to learn their national language. The menu, the signposts were also uh, displayed in uh, bilingually. So uh, we also uh, clarified such issue to the international community on the education and vocational training center. And all the students graduated from these centers in 2019, and all those centers were closed in 2019. So you just mentioned uh, forced uh, marriage for on Uyghur women. China applies a policy of freedom of marriage. For marriage is protected by the state, and uh, this is regardless of ethnicity. We believe that a marriage is a, free, a result of a free will between a man and a woman, and uh, any reason, uh, the regional factors, ethnicities should not be a factor. We often see that in a freedom of marriage, Uyghur women sometimes they have been restricted by the stereotypes or the tra traditional customs or practices. Some believed that they should not have mixed marriage with other ethnicities. They could only enter into a marriage with Muslims or uh, some believe that uh, their mar marriage should be endorsed by the religious leaders. Otherwise, they might encounter uh, hurdles when seeking marriage with other ethnicities. So, and sometimes they have been restrained in, to that effect. We also, we have also seen uh, sometimes uh, online uh, negative uh, discourse on mixed marriage. So we uh, believe that when we raise, air, uh, raise awareness, this situation has been improving and the freedom of choosing a spouse of Uyghur women has been further consolidated and enhanced. So uh, we have uh, seen some reports I apologize for interrupting, but we are drawing to the end of this morning's session, and we will have new opportunities to talk about forced marriage under Articles 15 and 16 of the Convention. Before breaking for lunch, I would like to give the floor to my colleagues, my fellow experts, for any follow-up questions. There are no follow-up questions. In that case, in that case, I believe that we will stop now for this morning and this afternoon. We will continue and meet here at 3 p.m. again to address agenda item four. So I adjourn the session. I will now give the floor to the Secretariat of the Committee, Mr. Schneider, for a few announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this, the reception by the Swiss Permanent Mission uh, for the launch of the second edition of the CEDAW commentary will take place from one, uh, starting at 1 p.m at the Vieux Bois restaurant, which is uh, when you leave, uh, the Prenigate is right on your left side. So it's starting now. Thank you. <laughs>